Hello and welcome to episode two of the Launchpad Space Podcast. My name is Paul Ring and I'll be your host as we explore the history of spaceflight in fact and fiction. Today's guest is a writer, blogger, creator of the Space Hipsters Facebook group. Yes, it's Space Hipster number one herself, Emily Carney. Welcome to the Launchpad. Thank you so much. I'm super thrilled to be on here. Thank you very much. Um, you're obviously you've really into space exploration and the, the history of it. What what got you into the? Uh, what made you interested in it? What grabbed you? Oh wow! Uh, what really grabbed me was it, it was uh, quite a long. T- well, it was a long time ago. Uh, I remember. Um, and I remember it very vividly. Uh, when I was uh, very young, I lived in uh, uh, Oldsmar, Florida, which is about probably 130 miles away from uh, the Space Coast on the other side of Florida. And I remember um, in uh, late 1981, uh, I was I was real little. I, I was three years old at the time, but I remember uh, very vividly uh one of the first space shuttle launches was happening. My mom was like, oh, the space shuttle's going up. Let's go outside, you know? So I was like, okay, you know, and you could see it from here when the weather was clear and it was it was a nice, a fairly decent day out. So he went out and then sure enough, when you look towards the east, you know, you saw this little flame going up and I was just like, oh my God, that's a spaceship. You know, there's people on that. And I didn't know who was on it. You know, I was I was real little at the time. I knew it was the space shuttle because I'd seen I'd seen pictures of it already and things like that. So I was kind of familiar with it, but um, it was just I was obsessed from there on. Um, later, I figured out what launch that was. I figured out it was um, STS two. <laughs> it was the second one, and uh, from that point on, I was very obsessed. Uh, as soon as I knew how to read, I, I got every little. Uh, every space book I could get my hands on, including uh, grown-up space books, yeah. uh, I was I was just obsessed. Like um, I really just grew up just reading about you know the space program and um, a lot of things, and I was really interested in that in uh, the sciences and things like that. So um, that's really what started my uh, interest there. And um, over the throughout the years, I, I tried. Um, obviously, I was into the space shuttle, but I, I tried to learn a little bit more about um, a lot of other programs, uh, particularly, uh, and a lot of people know this because I've written about it and talked about it a lot, uh, particularly Skylab, which uh, actually happened quite a few years before I was born, but uh, I tried to learn about it. I think it's very underrated, and uh, as a kid, that was another program that I was, for some reason, really fascinated with. I love the idea that there had been people living in space. I thought that was really cool. Um, for some reason, that really captured my imagination. So I, I really kind of got into that as well. So so that that's really what kind of started my interest was the shuttle program and just growing up during that. It was it was an exciting time when it first started. Oh, sure, yeah. I remember listening to the, the first launch, and I had a tape recorder, a cassette tape recorder held up to the TV so I could copy the the uh the broadcast and play it back you know as i was going to bed every night you know so i could listen to it and (laughs) relive it so it was really cool yeah Yeah. it wasn't until later that i saw launch um a few launches more up close Mm -hmm. uh from brevard county where they actually took place but um And the the noise from it was just by that point, I was like, holy crap, because from where I lived as a kid, you couldn't hear it. But when you got um, further up to it, it was like, wow, you, you really got to know how much power that ve- those the vehicle had. So it was just it was a really fun time. Yeah, I saw one one launch in person that was STS-131. And that was just that was from the press center. And it was just. It was amazing. It just hits you in your chest. Yep, it pins you like back. It's it was very intense. I yeah. I was expect I was expecting it, but I wasn't expecting it to be that emotional. It was oh, yeah. very 
because I was like, wow, this thing has a lot of power that in you know it, but you, you kind of don't. You have to experience it almost. Yeah. And then you think <laughs> there's like a, a bunch of people on top of that, too, <laughs> riding into space. Yes, exactly. You're like, that's crazy. But <laughs> it was it's really cool. That was just I um, I'm excited about what we're doing now. We'll probably get to that. But uh, that was a really neat kind of a neat time, I guess, in our space history. I enjoyed that. Uh, you're also a writer. You've written a lot. Um, I'm an NSS member, so I've I've read a lot of your stuff. Thank um, you. Yeah, and it's very good. I I, I enjoy it. Um, but what what uh, what attracts you as a as a writer for a subject? Well, um, that's a really good question because um, I found throughout the last I've been writing about space um, probably for gosh, 12 years or so, and I, I've been writing exclusively about spaceflight probably for 10, mm. and um, uh, it's kind of weird to see, like, I've, I've tried to look back, especially in the past year, because my blog is coming up on um, 10 years, mm. so I've kind of tried to look back, you know, and say, well, how, you know, how did it develop? How did it go from what it started to where it is now? Um, why did it do that? You know, um, I found out through the years, um, I kind of started my first, I don't think my first blog posts were very good. Uh, some of them, if you look at them, were really just silly. Uh, <laughs> just kind of, you know, me just being silly and doing kind of silly things. And I'm not sure if it endeared me at the time to the space community, but um, I really, over time, I would say probably within the last five or six years, I became very kind of, um, I guess, obsessed with uh, debunking kind of myths in space flight. Um, mm -hmm. One big one that I really got obsessed with and that uh, I still really think about is the, the whole, there was a mutiny on Skylab uh, myth, which I think uh, uh, a lot of people kind of joke with me about it because it's kind of my thing. Yeah. But I've um, it, it's amazing how many times that, that myth really does still show up. Um, I, I've seen people share it and they really you know oh yeah something went on there you know they really <laughs> insist something crazy happened you know during that time so um uh, and i know uh i didn't really know bill pogue that well um he i had i did meet him but he he he, he passed really before i could um uh, talk to him you know a lot but um uh, i've become kind of friendly with the other um two guys on who were on that mission uh uh, Gerald Carr and uh, Ed Gibson. They're both really awesome guys. I've talked to them. Uh, I've talked to Ed more than Jerry, probably. Um, mm -hmm. But it's funny because when you actually speak to the real people on that mission, you're like, there's no way they could have done anything on there. <laughs> like, you know, because they were being monitored all the time. And plus, they're really normal. They're not difficult at all. They're very nice, open, normal guys. Uh, you know, just because they may have gotten frustrated with their workflow it doesn't mean they you know threw a fit and had you know a strike or something yeah. i never really believed that i always thought there was something more to it so um i was like well, let's kind of dig into this so that that's been kind of uh satisfying for me because i think now people it's going the other way that okay this didn't happen um uh, another thing i've been kind of interested in the last five years is uh um writing about like kind of space flight figures that I don't know if they're more obscure, but that haven't been talked about as much. Um, okay. uh, my most uh, recent uh, series is series series is, um, <laughs> series that I did. I, I did a series about a uh, Brian O'Leary and Gerard K. O'Neill. Um, okay. uh, O'Leary was a, a former astronaut who um, was a scientist, and his career kind of took a very different <laughs> detour from what he had been doing. Um, and Gerard K. O'Neill was, a, a, I think, a finalist. He was a finalist, I should say, for the same astronaut class. And uh, he didn't make it, but he, he ended up writing, you know, he he really ended up uh, becoming the father of uh, the idea of space settlement. And he wrote, of course, The High Frontier, right. which is a, a classic. And um, so I was really interested in kind of comparing and contrasting, you know, their lives and stuff like that because... Um, O'Neill was more famous. He did achieve some fame during the 1970s, but I think um, it kind of, 
I wouldn't say he's an obscure figure because people still remember him, but I think his, you know, people kind of forget what he did and um, a lot of his ideas and, you know, and kind of, you know, what a interesting, you know, and beyond what he did as far as his, you know, work was, what a, you know, what what a interesting person he was, you know, and, and stuff. So I wrote about, I did a series about Ben. Um, I'm still... I might I might expand it into a book someday. I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, once this COVID is over, I, I need to do more digging uh, and find more of their personal stuff. And you know, obviously, mm. um, the most recent series I did was about Dr. Phil Chapman, who uh, was an astronaut in the 1967 astronaut class, but uh, he ended up resigning because he could see some writing on the wall that the space station he thought he was going to fly on wasn't gonna fly at all and um i think he just kind of got frustrated by you know a lack of scientific opportunities and at nasa at the time which which is understandable so i it was kind of neat to talk to him about it and gain a different perspective on that whole era versus what kind of others have written about that's what i was interested in you know you know about that time because i think you know it's kind of neat to talk to some people and you get a you know i like kind of finding out different stories about you know the era some of them run a little you know con they contrast to what you may have heard previously <laughs> but uh, i still think they're valid points because it happened to somebody you know yeah. so um that's kind of what i've been interested in in the last year is just kind of talking about i guess people who got forgotten or people who didn't necessarily fly to space but still had some kind of um, I think significant impact on the space program. So I think that's how my writing has really kind of, I hope that answers the question. I think that's how my writing has kind of developed over the last decade. You know, it, like I said, I find it interesting that just the subjects that you find are, are stuff I haven't heard of. So it's, it's great to actually, cause I've been a fan for so long. It's nice to have to read something about the space program that you didn't know about, you know, it's, it's like that uh, treasure hunt, almost. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm more interested in um, in writing kind of original things about, you know, stories that people may have not heard about, or maybe a perspective that people haven't thought about yeah. yet. Because, um, um, especially in the last year, uh, we had the the Apollo 11 anniversary and all that. And I love Apollo. I love the lunar missions. I, I'm not dissing the lunar missions by any stretch of the imagination but i mean i think we i, I think we hear a lot of kind of rah rah stuff about it and um you know i'm kind of interested in putting a different perspective out there that you know while those were amazing they weren't really focused on actual science and a lot of mm -hmm. things kind of got left out of the mix you know and i'm sure. i'm kind of like interested in okay let's talk about this let's talk about maybe you know, other opportunities that could have been taken around the same time, you know, that could have been very, you know, rewarding and maybe advanced the space program more so than it was, you know, mm -hmm. but as we know, uh, things happen differently. So, yeah. you know, I'm kind of interested in those stories too. Yeah. I've, I mean, I, I was born like in the middle of Apollo between Apollo mm -hmm. 13, and Apollo 14 and um, grew up with the space shuttle, but, Skylab wasn't a thing to me until I started like getting more mature, I guess you could say, in my my reading of of space history and some of the stuff that you've written it has have gotten me, you know, into it again. So it's really I appreciate that. I thank you for for that. No problem. No, I I, I appreciate. It. I'm glad somebody. I'm glad because um, sometimes when I write, you know, I'm like, man, is anybody gonna read this? You know, because. Um, a lot of people are interested. They want to hear about Apollo, you know, right. which is which is cool. I like Apollo. There's no, I have nothing yeah, against it, sure. but they want to hear about going to the moon, you right. know, and um, and those really are kind of the most popular articles, you know, and um, the things that I like to write about are usually something completely like what, like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nobody's thought about this in like forty five years, you know. Right. Well, I feel bad. Like I I interviewed. Al Bean a few years ago, like 2009, 
for the Apollo 11 anniversary, um, 40th anniversary. And I never talked to him about Skylab. It's like, and I was talking to his, to his daughter, and she's like, that's when he felt he was the best astronaut was during Skylab. Because he knew he, he was the commander. He knew it was, he'd been there before, so now he could actually, like, do the science. And, and it's like, I, I feel so bad, but I'm glad I got a chance to talk to her about it, because I got a little bit of a, of a, uh, of a behind the scenes for that. So that was good. Yeah. So I understand this would have been Space Fest weekend, uh, if not for the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's going to be disappointing to, uh, to not have that happening this, this year. Yeah, it is. It is disappointing. Um, but I understand. I'm glad, I'm, mm. I'm glad it was postponed because, uh, at this time it, um, it's in Tucson, Arizona. Um, at this point, it just it wouldn't be safe to get that many people together sure. under one roof. And I completely understand. Um, it's disappointing, but um, it's supposed to happen next year in July of 2021. And I'm sure it's going to be awesome once it comes back. Uh, yeah. I, and I'm really looking forward to it. I know it's a, a year out, but I'm already planning. <laughs> I'm already planning for it. So um so I'm sure it's going to be an awesome time, but um, we are doing, uh, there are, uh, we did have a, I, I didn't, I wasn't personally involved in it, but there was a panel today about the Outward Odyssey series. Um, the authors mm-hmm. for that, it was, the series was started by Colin Burgess. So there was, they had a panel today, which um, was done by the Space Fest organizers. And also um, tonight we're having some kind of, cocktail party get together i think online so that oh, that should yeah. be interesting so we've done a few things to kind of um mitigate the fact that there's no space fest um another thing that space hipsters has done and in about a week we're gonna have our our next one is we've had kind of these online zoom meetings uh where we where we uh, talk to somebody or several people who are significant in uh space or space history or uh, we've talked to authors, collectors. Uh, we've talked to some astronauts. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking to um, Mike Mullane, and the shuttle astronaut, and his yeah. son, Patrick, who has a, a new book out. Right. So that should be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to that. But we've done a few of those events, and they've gone really well. Uh, we we did one with Fred Hayes that um, I think last month that was really cool. Uh, never in my life did I imagine I'd be talking to Fred Hayes uh, from Apollo 13 that I remember as a kid, uh, a teenager watching that movie on, on VHS because we didn't have DVD yet like a million times, you know, just like, man, Apollo 13, that's so cool, you know. And then, you know, 25 odd years later, talking to him, you know, on my computer, it's just it's just been a wild journey for me, you know, just because I never in my life imagined I'd talk to any of these people, you know, oh, sure. it's been a thrill. Yeah, that's that's why I love doing this. I mean, I was able to do some writing um, for a local newspaper, and just to be able to talk to like people like Al Bean, Pam Melroy. Um, I forget there was a few others that I can't think of off the top of my head, but it's like it's like astronauts. They're like they've been in space. This is really cool, you know. And these are yeah. the heroes, and I'm like talking to them, and they'll, and they're calling me up. And I have to say, I love space hipsters i think that's this is like the greatest thing on the on the uh on facebook for me I mean, thank I'm, you i mean how how did that kind of start well um in about um my blog started in late 2010 and um in early 2011 uh the space shuttle program was kind of winding up uh and <coughs> Excuse me. One night I was hanging out at home and I, I was, you know, really my uh, space flight interest and enthusiasm really had, you know, kind of bounced back, you know, over the last year or so because um, I, I was always really into it. But, you know, just I started going to like, you know, Brevard to watch launches again and I started, you know, really getting into it again. In the one night um, in February 2011, I think it was February 15th, I was, you know, hanging out at home. I was on my computer, hanging out with my husband. 
and I asked my husband, I'm like, man, I want to start like a space flight, like a group on Facebook. I doubt anybody will join it, but um, uh, man, I really think it would be cool to have kind of like a, you know, kind of an online, you know, a meeting place or something, just to, just to, you know, vibe about space flight and just to talk about it, you know, just general space flight. And my husband was joking with me and he said, well, why don't you just call it space hipsters because you think you invented everything. And I'm like, huh, you know, that's funny. So I called it space hipsters thinking I can change the name, you know, if I hate it and stuff. And besides, nobody's going to join this group anyway. When it first started, it had four people in it. So I honestly believe, you know, oh, we'll probably just only have four people in it and it'll just peter out. Um, within a few months, <clears throat> we had gained probably a core group of about 100 people, which I was shocked. I didn't even know that there were that many space enthusiasts, really. I mean, I know that sounds very silly, but, you know, it was kind of the end of the shuttle program, and I didn't think we would um, have that big of a group, really. So I was like, yeah, 100 people, that's pretty incredible. Um, over the last decade, it's really exploded. Uh, now we have over 19,000 people in the group. Uh, wow. We're probably one of the biggest space flight enthusiast groups in the world. Um, and we have people from all, you know, international um, space flight communities. We have people who are from Europe, from, you know, Russia. We have people from, uh, you know, India who talk about space flight. Also, people from Australia. Um, all sorts of uh, continents and nations <coughs> and um we also have you know a lot of um uh we have a lot of you know uh, authors people who i grew up reading we have a lot of um and we over time a lot of you know astronauts and astronaut families join the group which made me feel proud not because they were like famous or anything but because they felt kind of safe enough to be in there that right. you know nobody would nobody was gonna you know bother them excessively and people would be very respectful towards them in there you know and um so yeah so it, it's been a wild ride over the last 10 years uh and we've um i'm very proud of our accomplishments i, I think we've we've done a heck of a lot in the last 10 years and i think we've maintained kind of a a good like a humorous but kind of a respectful tone which for me is very um not just for me uh, not speaking uh, for myself only, but um, for our other moderators, I think we've kind of achieved a very respectful tone. Um, another thing that we've done, and I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Lois Honeycutt, who's one of um, our moderators. Our moderating team is very close. Uh, they, they, you know, they. Um, I trust them with a lot of decisions because I'm not always, I'm not always there. Uh, sometimes I'm at work or doing, you know, you know, other things. But uh, Lois, in the last uh, probably five years, has uh, done a lot of uh, um, organizing, and she organizes uh, once a year field trips that um, you know people can sign up for and go on and go to like any you know a, a certain you know space place in the United States. Like um, I want to say, I think last year they there was a trip to a um, I think it was last year it was a trip to Mishu and the uh, Stennis Space Center. I want to say, um, and Fred Hayes actually was the tour guide, which was wild. Oh, wow. <laughs> I want to say one year they went to Huntsville and they got to see, you know, the Space and Rocket Center. Uh, one year they went to the Kansas Cosmosphere. Um, just things like that um, that are very kind of unique and special um, because, you know, um, this year they were supposed to go to the Stafford um, Space uh, Museum, I think, in Oklahoma. But unfortunately, uh, obviously, COVID happened, and um, we have postponed that uh, until mm -hmm. it's safe. But um, I think those are really special opportunities as well, because these are places that aren't, you know, as famous as Kennedy Space Center or Johnson Space Center. When a lot of mm -hmm. people talk about, oh, I'm going to go see NASA stuff, they go to one of those two places. Right. You know, and I think it's kind of cool that we have opportunities for people to go to kind of different places that are also really cool but that are kind of you know they're not as famous as those places and they but they still have a lot of the, the history that you want to see so I, I think that's really cool and 
and I gotta give Lois all the credit for that. She does um, all the organization for that stuff, so that's a big help. And um, I do want to say that moderators are a big part of success. It's it's not just a one woman show by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, they do a lot, a ton of work as well uh, behind the scenes that people don't even see, probably. So. Um, yeah, so I have to give them a ton of credit for the success of the group as well and for maintaining the the tone and um, everything. So, But that's really how... I hope that kind of answers how Space Hipster started. It started kind of just as a... Eh, I might... Eh, that sounds kind of neat. Maybe a couple <laughs> people will join, and then it just blew up, which I was... Honestly, I did not expect for a second. I, I figured it would be just something with a couple people and just something so niche that nobody would be into it you know yeah yeah i'm disappointed i only discovered it like a couple of years ago but i'm like as soon as i did it was like ah this is these are my people you know <laughs> so it was totally totally cool um well, what about the what's been going on now We're kind of the u.s is kind of getting back into the launch business it's, that's going to be exciting for uh for you and for the whole space hipster community. Yes. Um, well, um, last year Boeing uh, launched uh, their uh, their uh, capsule. Uh, I think the Starliner. Yeah. Um, it did have issues, but um, I know Boeing is working on uh, getting that spacecraft um, somewhat, you know, um, operational. So uh, it. I know they're going to do another test flight to ensure its safety. So um, I, I have, I'm being positive. I'm not going to say anything negative about it. I have every faith in the world that they'll uh, figure it out. Yeah. But um, or, uh, about a couple months ago, I think, uh, the DM2 mission to the uh, ISS launched, uh, yeah. the SpaceX Dragon, uh, Crew Dragon, and the, and the Falcon 9. And um, I was not there, unfortunately, because of COVID. I, I watched it from TV at home on my side of the state because um, it was a little too cloudy out to see it from here. Yeah. But um, it, I was just yelling at the, I was just <laughs> like, yes, it was a beautiful launch. Um, I was just thrilled. It's really exciting to kind of see people um, uh, go to space stations again from a capsule. Uh, that's yeah. very 1970s. And uh, I think true. that's very, that's very cool. I really think it's neat. Um, the last crew that went to a space station from a United States capsule was Skylab Four. So I was like, wow, that's really neat. I didn't, you know, there's kind of a little bit of synergy there or something like that. True. So I thought that was really exciting. You know that wow, we're finally doing that again. Um, I do think uh, I'm a big fan of the ISS and. Um, I think space stations are kind of, uh, I know some people will not agree with me at all on this and that's fine. Um, but, uh, I, I think space stations really, uh, teach us how to live in space for long periods of time. And that, and that's very important as, uh, we try, eventually we're going to have to, I think the, the, I think the ultimate goal is to settle space. Eventually it may not be in my lifetime. It may not be in, hundred years but I think eventually we're going to have to because um, you only have so many resources on earth and um, and I really think that's the ultimate goal of okay getting to space is settling either you know somewhere out outside of here or possibly on a, a planet or maybe the moon someday who knows um, and I really think space stations teach us how to do that you know how to right. you know how to live that way how to adapt to space for you know a period of time and that's going to really uh teach people how to do that so i'm very excited about us getting back to space from our own vehicles again um i think it's an important step to uh, the united states you know really establishing themselves as a as a space superpower again because we haven't had anything fly in almost god 10 10 years it's been crazy uh nine years yeah. Uh, since uh, STS-135, uh, you know, and um, yeah. as much as I loved the space shuttle uh, I, and as much as I hated seeing it end, um, I'm glad we've uh, kind of moved on to the future. Uh, the Crew Dragon is 
very uh, futuristic looking and it it's got the touch screens and it it's really uh it's it's not just cool but it it seems kind of a different level of functionality that the shuttle had right. um the shuttle was cool but it it was it was still a vehicle design in the 70s you yeah, know early 70s too <laughs> yes yeah the, it was it was of its time and it, right. i think um some people have argued with me about this and they're entitled to their opinion but i think it was time for it to be retired because you know it by the time it got retired it was about technologically 40 years old you know yeah. and um yeah it was i think it was time for something a little more upgraded and i, I think the dragon um I, I really i think the dragon crew capsule is awesome but when they showed the kind of the tour of inside the capsule i, I was just freaking out i was like <laughs> wow this looks like what space flight looked like you know when i was a kid like in books like wow this sure. is what it'll look like in the future and i'm like it's finally here you know that's really cool so i'm really excited about that um i know some people probably don't believe me because it seems in space hipsters there's a fight between you know spacex fans and you know ula people or whatever every day or so but i, I really like what spacex is actually doing I, um, I know they've gotten a lot of criticism, but I, I, I really uh, am proud of what they they've done recently. They've come a heck of a long way from their origins, and now they're actually getting people to space, which is I think incredible in a kind of a short period of time, about a decade or so. So uh, right. I think it's a very exciting time in spaceflight history. Uh, even though people kind of are more critical of NASA now, uh, I think I have been critical too, just because of the kind of the snail's pace everything has been moving <laughs> for the last decade um i but i do think it's an exciting time uh, i do think boeing will get it together um it might not be right this second but they will we got the crew dragon and um nasa is developing uh you know orion and the sls and hopefully that'll fly in the near future and um i we'll we'll see i i think it is there's a lot going on and i'm excited about the future I just hope we don't lose. Um, I just hope we don't kind of lose our, you know, our faith in space flight. I, I, th I still think there's a lot to do. And like I said, I think the ultimate goal is to eventually settle space someday. Like I might not see it, but I, that's something I would like for my ancestors or to see in the future someday. I think that's the ultimate goal. Sure. I mean, yeah, there's, um, it's so much goodwill coming out of NASA now, I think, and I think that's great, especially the state of the uh, of the government right now. It's, it's one of the, one of the few agencies where you can say, you know, people actually like it. <laughs> yeah, where people like support the, what they're doing, exactly. you know, and where people, you know, where it's kind of positive. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you completely. I think it's. I'm not going to get political here because right. I I don't want to get into that, but yeah. um. I think it's one of the few things right now where things are, you know, um, it's something to be very proud and positive about, you know, and I think as the future goes along, you know, hopefully we're going to see more and more and, you know, more cool things going on and more things to be excited about. And um, yeah. I do think similar to the 1970s in the last decade, I mean, we've had an incredible planetary exploration program. Um, we've true. had... Uh, New Horizons, which is going to um, uh, Ultima, I think Thule, um, mm. I think I said it right, and we uh, and it went to Pluto as well, which uh, nobody had ever seen Pluto up close ever before. Uh, right. We'd only seen some Hubble pictures of it, where which were pretty low res. <laughs> yeah. uh, not, they didn't show any features, um, so I really think uh, that was incredible. We also saw, you know, uh, Juno go to Jupiter. Um, which was really cool. Uh, we, you know, and we've seen uh, Dawn go to I think Vest, uh was it Vesta? Yeah, or I forgot what sure spacecraft exactly. uh, Vesta or Ceres or something like that. I I forgot exactly. I'm trying to like, you know, <laughs> um, on the other side of the ocean we had um, Issa's uh, Rosetta go to um, a comet, which was all and land on a comet. It had a mm. little lander. So I think the last 10 years have kind of, kind of been um, comparable almost to the 70s in that, you know, we didn't have a much human spaceflight, save for, you know, the, the Russians launching our people. 
Right. Um, but we have had a lot of incredible uh, planetary missions that have been going on. And I think people tend to discount those because, well, there's no people on board, you know. And right. I, I think we need to look at those, too, because, you know, th those are, I think, um, uncrewed missions are very important. You know, we have a lot of, and n not to discount the, the tons of space probes out there, you know, exploring Mars and the moon and the sun and, you know, whatever. I just think it's kind of been a watershed moment for those kind of missions as well. So I think it is very exciting still, you know, it may... But I don't think we hear about that stuff as much. That's true. Apart from the mutiny story that I, I hear see pop up on space hipsters um, somewhat regularly, um, <laughs> is always um, a, a joke of, of putting a, a picture of or uh, something about Baran up up there. Yes. How, how did that come to pass? What, what? How did that become a meme for the group? I think it was around 2015. Um, there was a story on a website it called Board Panda, and what happened was um, it was about you know these two guys snuck into this abandoned hangar in Kazakhstan, and you wouldn't that. believe what they found. And um, inside, you know, the hangar, of course, the big the big reveal was they found abandoned space shuttles, and you know it was for the Baran program. So the story came out, I think it was actually an older story from another website, but all I know is within about a day or so, like a hundred people shared it to space hipsters. <laughs> like, I mean, it was nuts. Like we kept, I, we just kept deleting it, deleting <laughs> it. Like, okay, there's a million duplicates of this. We know. So finally I s kind of snapped and I was like, look, you know, I love you guys, but we're aware there were space shuttles in hangers and we were aware of this please don't post the baron story again <laughs> so after that happened uh people started posting stuff about baron on purpose just to get on my nerves and um we now have a verb uh baron which is when a post is something is just being posted a million times you know people just can't stop posting about it you know but it's something that we've seen before a million times but uh to this day baron keeps showing up um and it's actually the subject of a bunch of very funny memes that are uh that are in space hipsters we've kind of embraced it now uh i think in our uh we do have a store uh like a merchandise store and uh i believe we still have a baron shirt in there for purchase <laughs> if people are interested in it but um yeah, so that's really what happened was people discovered Baran and they just posted about it a million and one times, you know, and it just kind of went from there. And to this day, it's a people and um, it's still a joke. And uh, the funny part is people still post that story sometimes, <laughs> too. They'll post it like, hey, have you heard of and it? And it's usually people who don't know they're newer members or whatever. Right. And after that, you know, they'll we usually are like, hey. <laughs> hey, there's a whole bunch of jokes dedicated to this, you know, and stuff like that. But that's basically what happened, and it's kind of just become synonymous with, okay, we've seen this a million times already, you know. So that's the story of Baran, and it still shows up quite a bit in the group. Well, that's that's one of the things that endeared <clears throat> the group to me. It was just like, you know, just really nice sense of humor. It's like, it doesn't take itself too seriously. <laughs> No, no. When I'm in, um, in my real life, I'm a pretty, I'm a bit, I'm a goofball. Like I don't take much seriously in my real life. Um, mm. I, 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 I try to be, you know, lighthearted, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I hope the group kind of reflects that because I don't take a lot seriously. <laughs> I don't take myself seriously, really. So, um, yeah, we, I, we kind of hope to have that spirit, you know, of kind of poking fun at ourselves a little bit in the group. Since I also talk a little bit about science fiction stuff, what are, you, what are some of your, your sci-fi or, or things that you get into? You, anything particular that you uh, that you like? I honestly am not very familiar with them, um, and I hate admitting this. Um, I am not as familiar with science fiction as I would like to be. Okay. Um, I've, I've, of course... Uh, I've read, you know, a, a few things by uh, 
Arthur C. Clarke. I don't know if he's considered science fiction or not. And Isaac uh, Asimov. I think that's how you say his name. Yeah. Um, I've read a few things by them. Um, uh, I've read a few science fictiony things. Kind. Well, he would be not happy hearing me <laughs> say that if he was still alive. But um, by Gerard K. O'Neill, where he kind of proposes things that sort of have a science fiction kind of cast to them almost but he would not like that because he viewed his ideas as serious right. so um but they they kind of have that you know sort of that futuristic you know flavor to them like this is what the world's gonna look like someday so um that's about as far as i go i don't I, 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 i'm ashamed to admit it because i like a lot of science fiction like like art um mm -hmm. i'm really into stuff like that um, there's a really cool book that I have. It's called Another Science Fiction, and it's by uh, uh, Megan uh, Prelinger, I think is her name. And uh, it has a lot of kind of uh, science fiction-esque uh, art and advertisements from the late 50s to the early 60s. Um, and it's a really cool book to have. And it does cover some of the, you know, the science fiction visions of people like uh, Von Braun and Will, Will Lay and stuff like that. And um, some of the art from that period. So I really like stuff like that a lot. Uh, I, I collect a lot of that art because I, I kind of love the vision that people had for that time, you know, not in, mm. and beyond. And I, I think it has influenced what uh, our vision of the future is going to look like. Uh, I, I really like a lot of space art that's like that. So, uh, but as far as reading it, I'm probably not as familiar with it as say other people are. So, okay, but I, I mean, but I like it. I'm not, a, I'm not against it. It's just, I don't think I'm an expert on it. Okay. It kind of works well into asking you about things like, um, uh, for all mankind. I, I know you wrote a, uh, a review, but I was wondering what, you know, maybe if you could talk about your thoughts on that being that it's sort of straddles the line between fact and fiction. Yes. Um, I really love... Uh, <clears throat> one thing I really do love uh, is I love alternate space histories. Okay. Um, there's a, a few of them that are really good. Uh, there's a guy, uh, a friend of mine, named uh, Gerald Brennan, who writes... Uh, he's written a few uh, space flight uh, kind of alternate space histories um, that are really awesome. I, I highly recommend them. If you haven't read them yet, yeah, um, and they're based on you know a lot of real scenarios that could have happened, so um, I, I really enjoy those a lot. Uh, I I wrote a a, a short uh, space alternate history for uh, last year's quest issue, and it was basically what what would have happened if like Gus Grissom had lived, uh, what would his career possibly have looked like, um, and. A lot of it was just uh, kind of me speculating on how it would have looked, but uh, it was a lot of fun to write it. it, it and I, I just loved it. I So I'm really into alternate space histories uh, because to me, they're just a lot of fun. It's kind of neat to think about, okay, well, what if what if this had actually taken place? What, how would have uh, human spaceflight have changed, you know, or uh, would it would it have accelerated or looked differently? Would have um, I loved For All Mankind. Um, I know not everybody liked the show. I think, uh, you know, some people were like, man, you know, it's it, this would have never happened. But I think that's really the point of it is that, you know, it, it shows a, a different Apollo uh, that included everybody. That included, you know, not just, um, you know, white Anglo-Saxon uh, men it included you know women uh, pilots as well because there there were women pilots in the 60s but uh, they were not um, allowed to really be part of the astronaut corps because they they couldn't go to the they couldn't have they didn't have certain requirements you had to become an astronaut basically right, like test pilot <clears throat> training and of course nowadays things are things are different but um, back then you know women really were not unfortunately considered for you know that kind of work uh, until the late 70s really mid to late 70s and i thought that was really cool to kind of include women pilots in there and also um you know minority you know pilots um and things like that i thought that was really cool to kind of have that you know futuristic okay this is 
you know, NASA kind of advancing itself by about a decade or so as far as like, you know, having different astronauts. And uh, at first I was like, man, that's a stretch. I don't think they would have hired astronauts then. But then I realized what they were trying to do with the show is they were trying to show an Apollo that lasted throughout the 70s and 80s. Right. And it didn't end with Apollo 17, which I thought was really awesome. So um, basically it was, you know, having a lunar program or an exploration program that that really stuck. You know, it didn't just yeah. end, you know, with Apollo. It, it it really stuck throughout, you know, the 70s and 80s. And they even had like a kind of a quasi Skylab on the moon, which right. I thought was cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought that was really neat. So, um yeah, so I really loved it. Uh, I and I thought it was fair to its characters because it showed them as real people, and mm. not just as you know, yeah, rah rah, you know, we're going to the moon and stuff. It showed them as people with real issues, which yeah. is, um, I think, pretty accurate. If you if you actually get into a lot of um, astronaut biographies, a lot of these people, you know, went through a lot of difficult situations. They they were human beings. Um, I think we tend to depict a lot of people as you know heroes and stuff like that and um i believe were they heroes yeah but they were also real people with real you know issues and stuff there weren't you know not everybody is perfect unfortunately and um some of my favorite astronaut books have really kind of peeled away, away at that veneer of you know perfection which i really think is kind of cool i like that you know sure. so i really love for all mankind and i i really love alternate uh, space flight histories there's a there's a guy on uh twitter i think his name is emmett smith i think i could be no um it is not emmett smith my bad why did i say that i'm an idiot um god I forgot what his name i know his name is reese but um he uh has been putting up kind of alternate skylab histories <laughs> recently of what if skylab had continued throughout the 70s what if they launched more of them and had you know more crews go there and i've really been loving it be cool. you know just because i think that's really cool you know the idea of okay we didn't end it we just extended the program and we did upgrades on it throughout mm. the 70s and 80s and even throughout the 90s you know and um i think that's just awesome so i love stuff like that just because it's kind of neat to see even though it didn't really happen, I kind of love seeing space history through kind of a different, okay, what if this program had been extended? What might have, what, what would that m may have looked, what, what may have that looked like, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So I thought, I think that's, <laughs> stuff is really awesome and I welcome. That's the stuff I actually think I, I, I actually liked um, for all mankind more as it went away from the the known history like as soon as Apollo 11 had the problem on landing it's like okay now now the door is open and let's see where it goes yeah I felt the same way um, I was a, even though um, here's a spoiler for those who uh, haven't watched the show yet if you haven't watched the show you may want to fast forward through these next few seconds <laughs> but um, uh, the part where they blew up the Saturn V, I was like, holy shit. But I was kind of yeah. like, nobody, well, I, it was kind of crazy, but at the same time, I was like, you know, I think it's fair to, I think it's fair to assume had Apollo kept going, there would have been a vehicle, like, at the very least, a vehicle would have had to abort and come back to Earth, you know? Right. I think at the very least, we could have expected one, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I don't think that's out of the question. So in a way, uh, I wish it hadn't been as violent, you know, but uh, <laughs> because I didn't want uh, one of the fictional, fictionalized real people to get killed. But at any rate, um, uh, I, I, I think it's fair to assume that had the program continued something like maybe not that violent, but something would have happened where, OK, a crew couldn't have completed a mission because they couldn't make it past you know florida or something right so i think that's i thought that was kind of neat that they wrote it in there even though it was kind of like what like yeah. when i saw that i was like oh my god like i had to cut it off and be like <laughs> okay do i want to even watch the rest of this show exactly <clears throat> so it, 
I suppose I I have to ask you about if I ask you about that I have to ask you about Space Force. I don't know if you saw that on Netflix. Uh, I, I'll I'll be honest. No, I have not watched any of it okay. yet. Um, I've heard good and bad things about it. I might still watch it. So um, we'll see. I haven't. I honestly haven't seen any of it yet. So okay, fair enough. I can understand where it could be an acquired taste too when you when you do see it. So, yeah, but I do like Steve Carell, so it's that was a plus. Yeah, he's funny. Yeah, great. I don't know. Let me, let me give you a, a last word. What, what do you? Uh, anything you want to say about space program, sp- space fandom? Well, um, I'm really. I I kind of want to just. Um, follow up with you know uh what i was talking about earlier uh i am very excited for the future of space flight um i know right now obviously the world and and the united states we're kind of at a low ebb because of everything that's going on uh especially with this pandemic that's been going on i don't think anybody predicted uh what this would have been like and um and I understand it. It's been very hard for, I think, everybody to just stay positive every day, you know, sure. going through this. But um, I'm still very excited, uh, despite all that, about the future uh, in space flight. Uh, I do think, you know, the next uh, 10 years hopefully will be very cool. Uh, you know, I'm very, ex- I'm very excited that we've gotten back to space and we've kind of proved that, okay, we can at least get back there, you know, and kind of... Um, have a program from there. Uh, if not, you know, I don't know when NASA is going to get uh, SLS and Orion flying, but um, I am very excited to see private companies like Blue Origin and uh, SpaceX. I'm very happy to see them kind of doing things as well. Uh, I think it's a very exciting uh, time because now we have private players who can kind of do their own thing. And um, and I and I. I'm very excited to see uh, what their visions are going to be like for the future. I really am. So uh, we have a lot going on, I think, in space flight more than people, I think, actually uh, give it credit, give credit to. Uh, you know, we have a lot of different things being developed right now. And, um, you know, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but I do think uh, the next 10, 20 years are hopefully going to be very exciting. And I think, you know, hopefully we'll regain that optimism that we've, we once had so uh right. yeah so i i'm i'm still keeping my optimism uh for the future and i'm i'm really looking forward to whatever the next step is and i'm hoping i'll be uh hoping i'll be there you know maybe at the press site when the next uh step happens who knows <laughs> so hopefully this pandemic will clear up and uh this we'll get a vaccine and everything will hopefully calm down we'll see so i am very that. much looking forward to the future to in space flight so we'll see and i'm uh very proud of uh space hipsters and i i'm like i said i think once you know the pandemic clears up uh we're gonna probably resume you know we'll do our field trip probably next year if hopefully if things are safe and um and i think we'll just continue to have a good time and to just keep enterprising you know space flight history and what we do and uh just keep up the faith and we'll enjoy it that's great. Okay, well, that's all the time we have for uh, Launchpad Space Podcast. I, I want to thank you, Emily Carney, for uh, for being here and, and sharing your uh, insights with us. Oh, no problem. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very happy you invited me. Thank you. Well, that's all we have time for today. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Launchpad Space Podcast. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever top-notch podcasts are aggregated. And please leave a review. Those reviews are very helpful. There are lots of ways to contact us. We're online at Launchpad Space One on Twitter, Launchpad Space Podcast on Facebook, and our homepage is www.launchpadshow.com. Do you have a space story you want to share or an idea for a future episode? If so, email us at launchpadspacepodcast at gmail.com. We'll talk again in two weeks on the next episode of the Launchpad Space Podcast.